I call Chris Hipkins. Mr Speaker, that was a totally intellectually and morally bankrupt contribution from this government. And I've been keeping note of all the arguments put forward by the national members in favour of this bill. That's it there. That's it there. The blank page. Because not one argument has been put forward by the National Party to justify why this change is being made. Not one less crime is going to happen because of this piece of legislation. There will not be one fewer victim created in this country because of this piece of legislation. This will do nothing. This will do nothing to reduce the number of people we have in our prison cells. And I say to Wayne Mapp, when he stands up and he says... The Point of order. Point of order, the Honourable Stevie uh, Chaddick. Sorry to my colleague, but the member who is sponsoring this bill is not in his own seat and interjecting in a most offensive way to the Speaker while he's on his feet. Uh, well, I'll, there's two limits to the member's point of order. One is changing the seat for the purpose of interjection. I don't think the member has done that. The member sat there for the whole period of the speech and is regularly in there. But on the second limb of your point of order was uh, interjections about haircuts. Now, I haven't had a haircut. Uh, recently, and several other things I haven't done. Uh, the member is quite out of court on that. I invite uh, Chris Hipkins. Mr Speaker, I think interjections like that reflect actually on the intellectual rigour that's behind this bill, because the, the most that Paul Quinn can come up with is to insult my haircut, rather than any kind of interjection responding to what I'm saying or justifying the bill that he's put forward. Because he had ten whole minutes in, the, in his speech at the very beginning of this debate to give us a single reason why the House should vote in favour of this bill, and he could not come up with one. Not a single one. He couldn't come up with a single argument to justify this legislation. And what did we have from Wayne Mapp? We had Wayne Mapp saying that we don't have enough punishment in this country. We don't have enough punishment. We have the second highest incarceration rate in the developed world. And we have the police commissioner of all people saying perhaps we should stop and have a think about that. And maybe we should wonder why we have the second highest incarceration rate in the developed world. And what happens to the National Party and their cheerleaders like Garth McVicker, that total disgrace of a man that's been totally discredited. We have them pouring scorn on Howard Board, the Commissioner of Police, for actually raising a reasonable argument and for raising some real questions that need to be addressed. Why do we have so many people in prison? That's what we should be talking about, not what we're doing to punish them and take away their right to vote, because the taking away the right to vote actually isn't so much a punishment at all. It's a deprivation of a right that should be universal and that should we have a universal franchise in this country. Because by majority, by majority, the entire society gets the say in determining what the laws are that result in people ending up in prison in the first place. And what we're saying is that we're going to deprive those who end up in prison of that particular ability to participate in that process, to actually have any say over the laws that govern what, what we deem as a society to be acceptable behaviour or not. And this government are pushing this through on the slimmest of margins in this House. It's going to pass by two or three votes. On the very same day, that they have been preaching the importance of widespread bipartisan support when it comes to significant constitutional change. There is nothing more fundamental in constitutional change than depriving the right to vote from a group of citizens, because they are still citizens. And we're not just depriving them of the right to vote when they go to jail, because we remove them from the electoral roll, which means even when they are finally released from jail, they are still not guaranteed the right to vote unless they re-enrol. And we are talking about some of the most marginalised people in society. And when they are released from prison, do we really think that the first priority they're going to have is to trot down to the post shop to get back on the electoral roll? It's probably not going to happen. The reality of this is, if we remove prisoners from the electoral roll, the odds of them rejoining the electoral roll in the future are very, very low. So we are ultimately likely to deprive them of the ability to vote forever. That is what this bill will do. Because if they just wanted to stop prisoners from voting while they are in prison, they could pass a law that stopped them voting while they were in prison. This bill doesn't do that. It removes them from the electoral roll. I have to say, though, I will give credit where it's due. This bill now, that we're debating in the third reading, is a significant improvement right. on the bill that was reported back by Sandra Gowdy's Select Committee, which did exactly the opposite of what it reported to do. 
It said it was going to remove the right for prisoners to vote. And in fact, what did it do? It gave the most violent offenders in this country the right to vote. And I say to the government, if they're going to do stupid things like this, if they're going to pass these kind of crazy laws, they should at least send them to a select committee with a competent chairperson, maybe somebody like Chester Burroughs. Maybe the Justice and Electoral Committee should be the committee responsible for debating a change to electoral law. Perhaps that would be a logical thing to do. Perhaps for a justice bill, having the Ministry of Justice provide some advice to the select committee rather than the Ministry of Corrections who are responsible for punishing people, maybe actually having the experts, the Ministry of Justice providing some advice, would have meant that we would have ended up a bill that actually did what it purported to do rather than a bill that did the opposite of what it purported to do, which is what that maestro genius over there, Sandra Gowdy, sent back to this House, a bill that did the opposite of what it said it was going to do. That's what Sandra Gowdy sent back to this House. It's no wonder she only had about three sentences to say in favour of the bill when she spoke earlier, because she did such a hash of the select committee process. It's such an embarrassment to the national government. It's no wonder none of their members are speaking in favour of it. And we have this blank piece of paper recording down for all of history the contributions and the arguments put forward by national members in favour of depriving prisoners of this right to vote. It is totally outrageous. It is totally outrageous, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the other thing that this bill does, and I think this is actually one of the fundamental points at principle here, is it reinforces the two-tier justice system that we have in New Zealand. Because some people go to prison for their criminal offending and some people don't. And we've had examples just recently in the newspaper and the Dominion Post earlier this year of a white-collar crook from the National Party who ripped off the taxpayer, who ripped off the taxpayer and got community service. He keeps his right to vote. And then on the other side, a poor criminal, a poor criminal who went to jail for doing something that was of no greater scale. They lose their right to vote. So the crook from the National Party who rips off the taxpayer rips off the taxpayer by abusing their taxpayer funded treble. They get to keep their right. Point of order, Dr Wayne Mapp. Point of order, Mr Speaker. I, um, the reason I'm taking this point of order is I think uh, the member ought to reflect on that we don't, in this House, comment on the actions of the judiciary. We do actually respect the role of the judiciary in, the, uh, in this House. We keep a separation. Uh, can I just say to the member, uh, that's correct, but on this particular occasion, uh, the member was not reflecting on a particular judgment. The member is quite within his rights to make comments about outcomes of cases. Otherwise, we would never be able to comment on those matters. Order. Oh. Order. I don't need to be careful. Well, I was on my feet speaking. If the member interjects, then it's against me on the chair. I don't need to be careful about anything. I've ruled the member has not crossed the line. If the member doesn't want to accept that, well then make another challenge. I call Chris Hipkins. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Mr Chair. Mr Chair, this bill does reinforce inequities in our justice system. It reinforces inequities, for example, somebody who is detained in prison for th less than three years will lose their right to vote, but somebody who ends up on home detention will not lose their right to vote. So we're going to have an inequity here. So somewhat for the same crime. So somebody who shows up to, prison, to, to court, for example, and cannot produce a home to be detained at, they'll go to jail and they will lose their right to vote. A rich person committed, committed exactly the same crime, has a home that they can be detained in, they will pay for, pay, they get a good lawyer, they pay for a good lawyer, they will retain their right to vote. It will be unfair, it will not apply across the board. We will have different treatment for people depending on their ability to pay. Somebody's right to vote under this bill is going to differ depending on their right to pay. And that's the kind of inequity that this bill put forward by the member, Paul Quinn, is going to reinforce, uh, reinforce in the justice system. And I don't think that's fair, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, this is a bad bill. It didn't do, when it was reported back from the Select Committee, what it purported to do. In fact, it did exactly the opposite. It gave the right to vote to our most serious violent offenders. At least that anomaly has now finally been fixed. At least that's been fixed. But the problem with the bill, Mr Speaker, is it does not do a single thing to deal with the fundamental problem. And that is why do we have criminal offending in the first place? 
That is what this House should be turning its attention to, not punitive measures like this, and certainly not punitive.